Dear my sisters and brothers in Christ, may the Holy Spirit give you hearts that are full of fertile soil, prepared to hear His Word, receive His Gospel, and to go and share that good news with others. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank You that You have come into our world, that You have entered and that You have cared enough for each one of us to give us the gift of saving faith. We pray that each and every day You would nurture that faith and strengthen that faith. Walk alongside us, giving us Your guidance that we might bear fruit that we might bear fruits of 30-fold or 60-fold or 100-fold, bringing honor to your holy name. Lead us always by your word and by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to tell you this morning about my neighbor. My neighbor's name is uh, Mr. Fragazzo. Now, I, I'm sure he has a first name, but I know him as Mr. Fragazzo. And I oftentimes will see Mr. Fragazzo outside working. Once in a while, he's cleaning his cars or working on his cars, but most of the time, Mr. Fragazzo is working on his lawn or working on his tree or working on his garden. Mr. Fragazzo takes great care of it. Now, he and I have never talked about how much water he uses, but his trees are green, his grass is green, his plants are thriving and growing. I figure I don't use much water, so he's set to use mine. But Mr. Fragazzo amazes me. It amazes me because, well, that's not exactly who I am. Now, I imagine some of you are like Mr. Fragazzo. You, you probably have grass that is growing, and I know some of you have trees, that, citrus trees that bear fruit. You have ro flowering uh, plants, but not me. And I imagine some of you can relate to me as well. Our yard, the only thing that's green are the weeds. When we walk down the Lowe's or the Home Depot in, through the gardening section, the, the flowers shrivel a little bit, and then once we get out of there, they pop back up. When we go in our yard, there's not much growing. Anybody else relate to that? Well, I've admitted that I'm not much of a gardener, and so it probably won't surprise you that I'm also not much of a farmer. In fact, I'm fairly ignorant of farming. However, when I was reading the gospel this morning, it strikes me as something odd is going on in this gospel reading. Here we were reading from Mark chapter 4. And we hear about this sower who sows a seed. A very familiar parable for most of us, right? We've heard it at least once or twice before. And we have this sower who seems to be somewhat haphazard in his seed sowing. He didn't spill it on the path. He sowed it on the path. He didn't spill it among the thorns, among the rocky ground. He intentionally sowed it there. He sowed it among the fertile soil, the good soil. And this strikes me as odd. Does it strike any of you as odd? Because even as ignorant as I am, I realize that most of you who actually do have gardens that grow, that you don't just throw your seeds out and hope that an orange tree sprouts up. Throw some seeds here and hope that a rose bush pops up. You take time to prepare the soil. You dig down. You replace the clay and nastiness that we have here in our dirt with good soil. You put fertilizer down. You put water in. Many of you drove past fields this morning that had near-perfect lines. They used GPS to make sure those lines are perfectly laid out. We see that even farmers today are not haphazard. And even if we go back to biblical times, while they may not have had GPS technology, they certainly did not just randomly throw the seed here, there, and everywhere. So what is the point of this parable? What is the point of this sower who seems to sow the seed everywhere? Well, let's look back at that parable. And I need to first set the context for you. Like I said, this first parable is really important to the Gospel of Mark. This is the center point of the first half. This is all about what's going on in Jesus' ministry. And so if you remember last week, hopefully some of you do, we had Jesus going back to his hometown of Nazareth, right? And were things good there? Not at all. His mother and his brothers, they said he was what? Out of his mind. Not my words, that's the Bible's words. The scribes, they made a special trip from Jerusalem to come down there and accuse him of his teachings being blasphemous teaching, even saying he's from the devil. And on the heels of that, Jesus travels to the Sea of Galilee. Because Nazareth was not on the Sea of Galilee, but it says he taught from the shores. And he teaches this parable. Now I've heard a parable described, I think the best way, as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I think that captures it well. 
And so when Jesus teaches in parables, he's talking about his kingdom. He's talking about the everlasting life and what it means to be the children of God. And so when we read about that parable, we see that he's also talking about some of the people he's encountered on his earthly ministry. Some of those in Nazareth, some of those in Galilee. And so he, when he talks about those various soils, we can imagine that he's um, thinking of certain peoples at that time. But I don't want to spend too much time on the soil because Jesus explains that. But if we look at it as a parable, we presume that the sower is God, right? Because the, one, the, the seed is the word of God, faith, right? That it was pr- it's planted. That's what the, our gospel reading told us. But Jesus doesn't get into this sower, does he? He doesn't talk about the randomness of this sower who sows the seed. But I think that this does tell us something about the nature of God. In fact, rather than seeing God as haphazard, random, as if he did not have intent, I'd like to suggest that he very much was selective and intentional in his sowing. In fact, I'd like to share with you not a word from the gospel, but a word from Paul that I believe emphasizes God's intent here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Did you catch that? He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. It is not that God was random or haphazard in any way, but God sprinkled the seed everywhere because he intended all to be saved. God chose you before the foundation of the world to be his child. As he sprinkled the seed on the path, it was his desire that even those who would turn their backs on him would have opportunity to be saved. Even those who would have a short burst of faith that they could be saved. Even those who would turn to the world instead of him have opportunity to be saved. And even those of us who have a loving relationship with him have opportunity to be saved. And so what this tells us is nothing profound, but I sure think it is beautiful because it shows us the truth that God was not random, but he desired for all people to be saved. That was not only his desire once he sent his son, but it was his desire from the beginning. Now, not everybody wants to be called a child of God, though, do they? Not everybody desires to be to, to believe in God. In fact, when we think about it, some people, when they, th- when they think of God, they think of him as, as equ- equate him to the, uh, the, the tooth fairy or, or to Santa Claus. They equate him to a, mi- a mythical figure instead of treating him as real. And sometimes they even treat Christians as if we are foolish for believing in God. Foolish for believing that there is a God. Weak for needing a God. And yet, does God just abandon them? Does God just leave them to be? In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says this, if anybody should reject you, speaking to the disciples, then just dust off your sandals, leave that house or leave that town. Does that mean God doesn't care about unbelievers? I certainly hope that you don't think that's the case. Because even as you read that, even as you see that, You have to know that Jesus cares about every person, whether they have confessed him as Lord or whether they reject him. Think about it for a moment. How many of you pray for people in your community, pray for people in your families who have turned their back on God, who maybe at one time had faith but have now turned their back on him? Do you think God stopped caring about them? Absolutely not. He still cares about them just as much as he cares about each of you. And I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I'm sure many of you know people in your lives, in your families, who are non-believers. And we know he, God cares for them because who else is leading you to pray for them? He is. But sometimes that's hard, isn't it? It's hard when we get picked on for our faith. It's hard when we're shut down for our faith. It's hard when people tell us that we're foolish or weak. So, so often, it's easier to just bury our faith. To hide those seeds, to cover those seeds, and to just get along in the status quo of the world. 
to just be those who maybe we have some fertile soil, but we're going to let it lay dormant for a little while. We're going to let that soil just rest. After all, that's good farming technique, right? To let that soil rest. But that's not God's desire. That's not God's plan. God isn't the one who rests and waits and and hopes and sits there in heaven thinking, maybe they'll come to me. But he pursues us relentlessly. I'd like to share with you some of Jesus' other words from Luke chapter 15. Some of you will, will know this parable as soon as I start reading it. But I think it captures who the heart of God and who Jesus is. So Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. To God, even one is worth it. To God, even one was worth sending his son into the world. To one, for one, Jesus came. He descended from heaven. For one, Jesus allowed his, his, to, to experience spite and anger and sadness and loss and pain. For one, He allowed His flesh to be torn by the cat of nine tails. For one, He allowed the nails to be driven through His hands. For one, He was willing to give His life. If you don't realize it, you're that one. You're that one. Jesus gave his life for you. For you. You were one, that one lamb. You were worth it. That one that he came to this world to give his life for. It wasn't your neighbor next to you, although he cares for, for him or her as well. It was for you. And that is how much Jesus cares for every one of those individuals. Whether the seed has been sprinkled on the path or sprinkled among the thorns or sprinkled among the rocks or even on that fertile soil. For one, for one, he was willing to give it all. That is the beautiful nature of our God. Not that he's random or capricious, but that he cares for every person because he has created every person and he loves each of us. The fact that he spread his seed everywhere shows the extravagance of his love. He is not one who chose some to be saved and some to be condemned, but he desires all to be saved. Now it's true there are those, unfortunately though, there are those, who even as they go through this life, they will continue to reject Him. They will continue to slam the door of the fa- in His face and reject His pleading, His desire for them. But there are those whose hearts are being changed all the time. There are those whose hearts are being changed by the Gospel message, by the forgiveness of sins. And you all are evidence of that. Because the Lord even now is working in your hearts, in your lives. It is not your, your desire for Him, but His desire for you that you have been saved. He came to you. And maybe it wasn't early in your lives. Maybe it wasn't at the baptismal font when you were an infant. Maybe it was much later. Maybe it was someone who had been praying for you through your whole life so that you would come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe they had been planting those seeds and sowing those seeds and they realized it wasn't them, but it was the Spirit working that whole time. Because that's what happens when you have fertile soil. Because God takes that fertile soil and He bears some amazing fruit. Listen to the words of Jesus again. Those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the Word and accept it and bear fruit. Thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Part of our walk with God is bearing fruit. We don't just, we're not just fed with that fertilizer and the good water of His Word and the good, to, uh, good worship of His uh, and the hymns and the, the richness of our liturgy, but it is that gift of God to go forth, to bear the fruit, to share the fruit, to proclaim the good news. It's that gift of God to go to other people who have lost and share with them the hope that we have. And knowing that even as we sow those seeds, it is not us who makes them alive, but it is God. Paul said in our 
epistle reading for this morning from to the church in Corinth. He said, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Yeah, we get a chance to sow those seeds. We may not see the results, but it's the Spirit who's working on the heart that whole time. And it's the Spirit who will make them bloom and blossom into the people He desires them to be. But God uses us. He uses us to bring those good words, to bring that good news. He uses us to proclaim that message. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a green thumb of gardening. It doesn't mean that you have to be good, good at growing plants like Mr. Fergrazzo is. No, in fact, God can take our missteps, our mistakes, even our prayers, and He can do some amazing things with those. But it's that trust in Him. It's that fertile soil knowing that He can use you. That as He shows you, He can use you. And I want to kind of, maybe you all know about this, but I just recently learned a little bit more about composting. And you, you, you realize how composting works, right? And when you think about composting, you take the dead things. You take old shells that came from, from, from your eggs. And you take uh, uh, broccoli that went bad in your fridge. And you take uh, old grass clipping. And all those things are, de- are dead, aren't they? And God takes all those dead things in us and, and he makes them alive. Just like in a compost pile, all those things, they, they, over time they, they, they break down. And, but what comes from that? Rich, fertile soil. Food to feed. And God takes those things that were dead in us. He makes us alive so that we can share that rich food of the gospel, that rich food of forgiveness, that rich food of his grace. So dear people of God, I pray that as he has given you fertile soil, that you would allow him to work in that soil, that that you would allow the spirit to work through you so that you might see a crop of 30-fold, 60-fold, or even 100-fold through you that many more will hear the gospel message. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word, that we have received this good news, and that we can call you Lord. We thank you that even amidst the rejection of the world, that that we know our salvation is secure. We pray that you would forgive us for those times when we grow content to just be fed, to just just feed from what you have give us lord we know that there are times when we need that times where we need to be fed but help us also to use that what you have given us to go forth to share your good news to bear great fruits knowing that it is never us but it is always you working through us that even if we feel like we are ill-equipped or unprepared that we know that you can use us for we are yours and so we pray lord that you would send us forth Send us forth into the fields that are, that are ripe and ready to be harvested. Send us forth to share that good news so that all may come to know you as Lord and Savior. For you are the God who in extravagant love desires all people to be saved. We pray this in the most powerful name of Jesus, who is our Savior. Amen.